Okay, thank you very much for the kind invite to come and speak at this meeting. Um, I've been given the challenge of trying to cover the whole of glaucoma diagnosis and management in the next 30 minutes. But what I'm going to focus on really is the key pointers in terms of what advances um, have happened in the last sort of decade and how are we managing glaucoma in 2023. So I think the first thing I would say is that um, glaucoma is a condition, unfortunately, which is still uh, very often missed. Um, really, the, the, the mainstay of treatment for glaucoma um, is obviously um, to lower the IOP, but you have to identify cases early. And unfortunately, we still see patients too late. And the biggest risk factor for blindness in glaucoma is late presentation. Now, when you're diagnosing glaucoma, I think the most important thing that you can do is actually dilate the pupil and have a look at the disc. I think that is the, the, the best way of diagnosing glaucoma. So a skilled clinician looking at the optic nerve um, in, on a slit lamp is still the best way of diagnosing glaucoma. We have good adjuncts like OCT, but OCT doesn't always give you the answer. In fact, sometimes you can get false positives and false negatives. We also need a uh, visual field. Again, there's, um, there's a problem here because I'm not seeing my image here. I can see it here. Can you see it? Oh, okay, so I have to go back. Okay, so, and that's, um, yeah, it's okay at the moment, okay. Um, so obviously the, the, the other tests that we do to diagnose glaucoma is uh, visual fields and the standard for that is your uh, Humphrey visual field. I know in the community people do screening fields but really, this is obviously the gold standard. Um, um, sorry about this. I think there's a, there is an issue with your setup here. But anyway, we'll carry on. Um, so one of the key questions is, why does the intraocular pressure go up? Because the intraocular pressure is the main risk factor for glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And we believe, although we're not sure, is that in open angle glaucoma, in, in any case, the commonest cause of glaucoma around the world, what happens is that you get increased resistance to outflow in this area here of the angle, the trabecular meshwork. This is Schlem's canal. And so the fluid, the aqueous humor, can't pass as easily through the trabecular meshwork. And so the intraocular pressure has to rise to maintain a constant flow of fluid through the eye. But unfortunately, that rise in intraocular pressure impacts on the optic nerve. The optic nerve is the only point in the eye which is the, the weak area. Um, it's the, an opening in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the eyeball, and that's where all the pressure and the stress concentrates. We know that in angle closure, the mechanism is uh, the iris directly coming into contact with the trabecular meshwork. So the glaucomas are actually a heterogeneous group of diseases where the characteristic changes are the optic nerve head and visual field. And raised IOP is the main established risk factor or the main modifiable risk factor for glaucoma. The thing I would say here is that even primary open angle glaucoma, your bog standard glaucoma is heterogeneous in its presentation and its progression. And that's why you can't, if there isn't one size fit all when it comes to this disease. And this uh, scheme really shows you the sort of very basic classification of glaucoma. Uh, you have the open angle ones, you have the closed angle ones, and you have primary, secondary in, in each of these categories. And these are some of the sort of various diagnostic entities that you will recognize. Now, in terms of diagnosing and managing glaucoma, one of the important things, and this is also uh, important from the point of view of optometrists referring, is to phenotype the patient, to understand the risk factors. And the risk factors for glaucoma are age, as you get older, glaucoma is more common because the optic nerve gets weaker. Uh, race, so in Afro-Caribbeans, uh, the uh, preponderance of glaucoma is much higher. Family history, very important. Refractive error. Increasingly, we've recognized that in myopia, in myopes, glaucoma is more common. And the difficulty is the optic disc interpretation is also complex and challenging in these patients. Uh, central corneal thickness. And then you've got slightly weaker factors like migraine, Raynaud's, and steroid use. So if you look at IOP and race, for any given IOP, the proportion of patients who are African Caribbean who have glaucoma is much, much higher than those who are um, Caucasian. So there's something about the optic nerve head in Afro Caribbeans that make them much more vulnerable to the effect of raised intraocular pressure. 
Family history. So the population risk for glaucoma is about 2%. Um, when you have a first degree relative affected with glaucoma, that risk increases to 22%. Um, so about tenfold higher. And in general, the glaucoma phenotype in a family is very similar. So if you have a family history of blindness, then you have to be extra careful about that particular patient and how you manage them. And so it's very important not just to ask, have you got a family history of glaucoma, but what actually happened to your relatives? Did they, were they treated with eye drops? Did they end up needing surgery? Did they end up going blind? So those are very, very important questions um, to take when you're asking about the family history. Corneal thickness, another important factor. The mean in the population is around 550. It is established that it, it is a risk factor for progression of ocular hypertension to glaucoma. That was shown in the OAT study. It's a risk factor for presenting with more advanced disease. And the question is, does having a thinner cornea affect the IOP or does it affect the biomechanics of the eye as a whole? And we know that CCT is reduced in NTG, normal tension glaucoma, and in Afro-Caribbean patients. The other interesting thing over the last um, few years um, has been the ocular response analyzer. Um, and this is being used more and more. Um, and this gives you an idea of the uh, biomechanics of the cornea. So, for example, you can have a thin cornea, which is rigid, but you can have a thick cornea, which is more pliable. So the corneal thickness by itself perhaps doesn't give you all of the information. So uh, what we're measuring here is something called corneal hysteresis using um, this device called the ocular response analyzer. And in essence, the way you measure the hysteresis or the deformability of the cornea is you apply a, 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 an air puff to the cornea, uh, air puff pressure, and the cornea will flatten and give off this signal um, off on the surface when it's completely flat, just like a mirror. And then the pressure continues, and on the way out, the cornea will give another signal. So there's a, a sort of a deformation, and then as it kind of recovers, you get a second peak. And the difference between these two gives you a measure of the hysteresis. And what's been shown is that, um, that low hysteresis reading, so if you have a low hysteresis, that means the eye is the more rigid. That is a risk factor for glaucoma progression. Okay, and so that may reflect the rigidity of the scleral opening um, at the back of the eye, and therefore the stresses and strains that are going to affect the optic nerve are greater in eyes with low hysteresis. Um, now, myopia, and I've mentioned this already, uh, another risk. Now, this is particularly important from the point of view of LASIK. Okay? There are a number of patients I've seen over the years who've gone blind from glaucoma or lost substantial amounts of vision who previously had LASIK in the early 2000s. And the reason for this is they keep going to see their optometrist. The pressure is normal every time they're seen. The discs are difficult to interpret, and so the patient gradually loses vision while they're under the care of the optometrist. So very important that you ask them about a history of laser uh, refractive surgery, okay? More and more patients are having LASIK done, and so the corneas are thinner, the, the biomechanics are different, but as I said, the myopes are also the group which are at higher risk of glaucoma. So very important that you, uh, you think about these things. Hyperopia, obviously there's a risk of narrow angle glaucoma. Migraine um, is a softer risk factor, but may be important in normal tension glaucoma. Diabetes, we're not quite sure whether that increases the risk or doesn't affect things at all. Uh, conceptually, you might think that it would because diabetes affects the microvasculature of all structures in the eye. Optometrists are increasingly using OCT now to um, diagnose glaucoma. This is a fairly barn door case of an Afro-Garabian patient um, where the signal is all red. Very important that you have a look at the whole um, scan. You don't just rely on this um, look at the quality of your scan, the segmentation, okay? Um, and the other issue is that a lot of the databases that are used for these OCT machines are not necessarily in Asian or Afro-Caribbean patients. They're usually in patients of European descent. So again, that's something else that might affect interpretation. Uh, you often get referred patients with suspicious looking discs. So this disc looks quite suspicious, when you, but when you do the RNFL, it's completely normal. So it helps, in my view, in diagnosing when there isn't glaucoma. 
Um, this is another one. Uh, if you have a look here, this patient uh, was sent in with a cup disc on the right side. But if you have a look here, it's because the disc is much bigger. Okay, so that's another classic example of a patient who doesn't have glaucoma, but the RNFL is completely normal. Now, the diagnosis is not always straightforward. So who thinks this patient has glaucoma? Put your hand up. No one, okay? <laughs> okay, so that is a, a quite a cup disc. What would you expect the field to be like? Quite bad, right? Minus 10? Okay, that's the fields, okay? So this patient has, has came, came to me for a second opinion, has been followed up in their local eye clinic for many, many years, uh, pressure around 19, 20, and they've been told they're okay. They're far from okay. This is a patient who has what we call cliff edge discs. When they start to go, he's going to get rapid progression of vision. So from my perspective, he's going to need an escalation of his therapy. He might even need surgery on that eye. He's only in his 50s, okay? So the important thing is, it goes back to what I said at the beginning, the disc is king. You have to look at the optic disc. Often, you have to have substantial damage to your optic nerve before you get a field defect. So pe people say, well, mild glaucoma is minus four. Is it? And actually, you need to know 50% of your ganglion cells before you get a field defect. So is that actually mild glaucoma? I think we need to rethink some of the things that, that, that we're told. Okay, therapy. So in medicine, we treat patients for two reasons, symptom relief and prognostic benefit. In glaucoma, in primary open angle glaucoma, we are treating patients for prognostic reasons. And what that means is, we're trying to alter the natural history of their disease. So if you don't treat a glaucoma patient, the likelihood is that over their lifetime they will go blind. And what you're trying to do is to alter that natural history of the disease. And what we know is that if you look at this graph, this kind of shows you visual function versus age. We know that if you uh, do not intervene, the patient will go blind in their lifetime. If you intervene early, hopefully, you can maintain their visual function over their lifetime. But remember, even with treatment, in some patients, glaucoma will continue to progress, albeit more slowly. So the idea is to change the rate of progression, okay? Um, if they present late, so again, this is the issue about late presentation, they are much further down in terms of the number of ganglion cells left. So trying to keep them seeing during their lifetime is much more of a challenge. Okay, so when we think about glaucoma therapy, you have to ask yourself, what are we actually treating? We're treating a risk factor, we're not treating a disease, okay? Um, the major risk factor is IOP, okay? This is a bit like if you imagine someone has a cholesterol of seven, they're gonna feel fine, but it's the, the, the impact that high cholesterol is going to have 10 years from now by causing a heart attack or a stroke. So in the same way, when you're treating IOP, what you're trying to do is to preserve the end organ, which is the optic nerve, um, uh, subsequent, in subsequent years. So we know that lowering IOP reduces the conversion of ocular hypertension to POAG. We know that it also reduces POAG progression. Very important that you consider patient's attitude to risk when you consider therapy, because a lot of these patients, particularly those that you're thinking about operating on, um, or suggesting surgery to, they have no symptoms. And this is a difficulty in glaucoma. In early glaucoma, you don't have symptoms. Or even in moderate and sometimes in advanced glaucoma, you don't have any symptoms. And you have to convince the patient that if they don't have surgery, things are gonna get worse. And often what I will do is I will show them their visual fields, and that is the way that you can show a patient that there is a problem. So um, the importance of glaucoma treatment is to maintain the patient's uh, visual function and related quality of life at a sustainable cost. And the cost of treatment in terms of convenient, inconvenience and side effects as well as financial implications for the individual and society requires careful evaluation. And quality of life we know is closely linked with visual function and patients with early to moderate glaucoma may have good visual function and, and modest reduction in quality of life but quality of life is, is considerably reduced when both eyes have advanced visual function loss. So the idea is that we have to prevent progression, prevent blindness, but also maintain the patient's quality of life. 
Now, this was uh, one of the biggest uh, trials done on the, um, the impact of latanoprost on progression of glaucoma. So this was basically the UK GTS study published in The Lancet. And what it showed was that at 24 months, the patients who were treated with uh, latanoprost, less patients progressed. Um, and in the placebo, more patients progressed, okay? The difference was about uh, 10, 10 to 15 percent. Now, the point I'm making here is that even those patients who are treated can progress, okay? And that may be due to multiple other factors. It may be the eye pressure isn't low enough. We don't fully understand that, but that's the point I was making earlier, that you have to slow down the rate of progression for that patient so that they don't go blind in their lifetime. So if we look at glaucoma therapy in the 2023, what are we now doing? We're obviously still using medical therapy. Um, laser SLT, as, as you will have heard, has taken a front line in the sort of battle against glaucoma. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, ex there's been a massive explosion in the field of minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And on the horizon, there is also depot therapy. Uh, this, these are basically uh, drug implants you can put into the eye, which elute drug over sort of a year or two years. And they're on the horizon, probably in the next two years, we'll start to see them um, commercially. So SLT laser has probably, it's been around for about 20 years, but only in the last three or four years have we seen big randomized trials coming out showing that it is uh, effective. Now, and the NICE have issued these guidelines very recently based on the, the LIGHT trial, which I'm sure you've all heard about, um, that SLT laser is now first-line treatment or should be offered as first-line to glaucoma and ocular hypertension patients. So what did the LIGHT trial actually show? It was completed in 2019. It was basically um, a randomized control trial comparing SL... Uh, this is treatment naive patients, it was comp comparing SLT laser to eye drops. And the primary outcome measure was quality of life with secondary outcome measures such as visual acuity, IOP, cost, disease progression, and need for glaucoma surgery. And I think this is one of the best trials in glaucoma that's happened in the last 20 years. Um, the, the sort of headline take home messages are that at 36 <coughs> months, 95% of patients are undergoing SLT were at target IOP, okay, with 75% of patients off eye drops. 36%, 36 eyes in the eye drop group should show disease progression compared to 23 in the SLT group. So there's more progression in the eye drop group. Now, perhaps that's because patients don't put their drops in properly or when drops go in, they don't control the diurnal fluctuation and SLT does it better. But certainly this is the first trial to show the impact of this. And this is very, very interesting. In the eye drop group, 11 patients required trabeculectomy surgery compared to zero in the SLT group. And I think this is a very, very big difference that this trial is showing. And the cost analysis showed that from a cost effectiveness point of view, SLT was more cost effective than, than eye drops. And so uh, the American Academy of Ophthalmology have also added SLT as their first line treatment. In terms of what the ideal protocol is to treat patients, uh, this is what the LIGHT trial used. So those of you doing SLT need to think about this. Uh, you treat 360 degrees of the meshwork, 100 non-overlapping shots, 25 per quadrant, and the energy you decide by the, uh, when you're doing the laser because you look for a reaction, which is the number of bubbles you see. You don't want to see too much in the way of bubbles. Just to give you the six-year data for this same trial, um, again, just to sort of uh, headline, I'll just give you the... Um, so trabeculectomy, so 70% of patients remained at or less than target IOP without the need for medical or surgical treatments. So that's very effective. Trabeculectomy was required in 32 eyes in the um, drops arm compared with 13 in the SLT arm. I'll just flick through this. Now, in terms of medication, uh, these are the medications. We still have these medications available. There are some new drugs on the horizon. These are your rokinase inhibitors. Um, they are just about uh, coming into uh, the market commercially. But the other big uh, area where there's been an explosion, again, um, is this area of MIGS or microinvasive glaucoma surgery. So a huge number of devices. So 
Um, I was quite fortunate in that I, I got into this in 2009 when um, we started using the iStent. So I've been in this for about a decade, but there's been a huge explosion in the number of devices that are now available to treat glaucoma uh, minimally invasively. And these are some of the devices that I've used over the years at various time points. Um, we can now do trabeculectomy um, um, in a much more uh, minimally invasive manner. This shunt called the Preserflow shunt um, basically goes into the anterior chamber angle and drains the fluid into the subconjunctival space. Um, and this can be done in, a, in about 20 minutes, half an hour. And I think really it, the, the modern sort of glaucoma management scheme is, uh, is laser probably first now um, and medications. And then you, when the patient gets a cataract or sometimes even in patients who have very mild cataract and they're over the age of 60, I will take the lens out and do a mixed procedure. Um, and then trab and tube have been relegated to further down the line. But what it does mean is we can manage our patients better with less medication and hopefully they will progress less. We know from lots of studies that cataract surgery itself can be effective, but the, the effect of cataract um, extraction on IOP can wane after a period of time, and this has been shown in various studies. So this is the IOP dropping in the cataract extraction group, but it starts to go up again. But if you add a mixed procedure, like an eye stent or a hydrus, then that IOP reduction is maintained. We think that cataract extraction, if you uh, think about it, if you remove a big lens and put this little plastic lens in, it actually uh, alters the tone in the trabecular beams probably, and that's how it's reducing the IOP. This is a, a randomized trial of uh, the hydra stent compared to cataract surgery. And what this really shows is that in the presence of the stent, more patients at 24 months are medication free. So almost twice as many patients are medication-free compared to the cataract group alone, okay? And the reason they did the, the way they did these studies was they compared cataract surgery plus the stent versus cataract surgery alone, because cataract surgery alone we do also know lowers pressure. But what they found was that basically if you use a stent, then more patients are, are off medical therapy with a controlled pressure at target, off medication, at the, the two-year period. And some of these trials have now looked at five years, and at five years, that difference is maintained. These are some of the other newer devices that we've been using. These are catheters that go into Schlem's canal. Um, and I'll show you some cases in a minute. Um, now, one of the things that I've been very interested in is that it's all very well getting people off eye drops, one drop or two drops, when you do these procedures in mild disease. But the question is, can we actually use these to do safe glaucoma surgery in more complex patients. And I'm just going to give you an example of uh, two or three patients. Um, this is a very complicated case. So he's got angle closure glaucoma in the context of relative anterior microphthalmos. So he's got a small anterior chamber, but the back of the eye is relatively large. So actually, he's myopic. He hasn't got a hyperopic pr prescription. And he came to me uh, on every medication under the sun. Uh, his vision's reduced due to glaucoma damage. And his pressure was still um, 15 in one eye and 33 in the other eye. And I'm just sorry, the field. And that's the field in one eye, that's the field. So this patient has good going blinding glaucoma. So this is what we did for him. So he, because he's got an angle closure component, this is actually a relatively clear lens. We're going to do a clear lens extraction here. Um, and we're just opening up the, this is a lens capsule we're opening up. And um, we open this up and then hydro dissection to free up the lens. We use phaco emulsification to break up the lens. And then we put our foldable uh, lens into the bag. And now this is the important bit. Um, we're going to look at the angle. So you can see here that the iris is stuck to the trabecular meshwork. And what we're doing is we're peeling away the iris off the trabecular meshwork to try and get this canal working again. Okay. Um, and then once we've done that, I'm going all the way around, 360 degrees, okay? We're now going to use our eye track catheter, because if the trabecular meshwork has been stuck to the iris, the likelihood is that the outflow system is dysfunctional. And, the, and, the, and so what we're doing is we're going to rejuvenate the outflow system by putting this catheter in, and the catheter injects viscoelastic at high pressure into Schlem's canal, opening up the canal, okay? Um, it's a bit like doing an angioplasty when you're dealing with, with the, the heart arteries. Now, we've done all of that, that's the end of the operation, and we did this on both eyes. Now, 
At six months, the patient, his vision has improved and his pressure is eight in one eye and 12 in the other eye, okay? And he's only on monopost and COSOP now. And he's very happy and his visual fields are stable. Now he might need glaucoma surgery in the future, but we've actually managed a very complicated case here with a very minimally invasive approach. Another operation um, which I think has uh, great power uh, is the, the GAT procedure, something that we introduced to the UK in 2017, and we've got now six years follow-up of some of our patients now. And what you do here is you basically pass a, a, a suture or a catheter all the way around Schlem's canal, and when you pull it inwards, you're basically cleaving through the trabecular meshwork, okay, and allows aqueous humor to get back into the canal over 360 degrees and there's been a lot of publications over the last three or four years on this but what's interesting is a lot of these glaucoma procedures if you if you go back in history they were described or the concepts were described more than 50 years ago so murray and johnston grant who did a lot of the seminal work on outflow resistance showed that if you put a suture into the canal and you split the tm like that because that's what's happening histologically um, you can increase the outflow fluid, you can reduce the outflow facility. So let's look at an example of a, of a patient. So this is a patient who literally pitched up to our eye casualty with blurred vision, and he was found to have pressures of 60 in both eyes. So this is juvenile open angle glaucoma. It's a blinding condition, it needs surgery. We put him on maximal treatment, and his pressure settled at around 40. He needs an operation. These are his visual fields. So that's the, uh, that's the right left eye, that's the right eye. Now, if we look at the histology of this condition, um, people who have taken trabeculectomy uh, specimens um, in the past have shown that if this is Schlem's canal and this is the uh, trabecular meshwork cell, you have this increased deposition of matrix under the Schlem's canal endothelial cell. And we believe that this is what increases the resistance to outflow. So the disease in this patient is in the trabecular meshwork. So if you treat the trabecular meshwork, you should be able to treat the disease. So this is what we did for the patient. So we're going in with our um, catheter again. We open up a Schlem's canal with an MVR blade and we go all the way around with the catheter. You can see the blinky light coming all the way around. And then what we're going to do is grasp the catheter, pull it inwards towards us. And as, as we do that, we open up the trabecular meshwork. And we do that all the way around. You can see that little cleft that's opened up, okay? Um, and that's what we did on this patient, both eyes, okay? And just to give you, an, just to show you, this is what his result is at five years. His pressure is 12 in both eyes on, on a, single, a couple of uh, drops with stable visual function. That was his visual field in 2017. That's five years later. So, you know, most surgeons in the past would have managed this uh, child, uh, child, he was a child, with trabeculectomy. And trabeculectomy in juvenile glaucoma is very complicated, has a high risk of complications. With this gentleman, I saw him, in fact, I saw him last week, he's still stable. And the longer he can remain stable, the better, okay? Ideally, we don't want to operate on him for another five or, t or 10 years. Um, I was going to talk about angle closure as well, but I've run out of time, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much.